There's a couple of caveats. Um, the first thing is TLDR, yes it can. But it's easier um, to have this talk title than can Python really make infrastructure management easier because not many people would have came to that talk. Um, this talk has sort of evolved even further in the past few months. It's, it's now actually really called um, infra Modern Infrastructure as Software, but it's about Pulumi. So my name's Paul Stack. I'm Stack72 on Twitter. I work for a company called Pulumi. Everything you see here today is open source. It's free. You do not have to pay for it. It's not a sales gig. But if you do buy it, it will help me feed my future children, so please do. <laughs> future, future children. Um, okay, so we're in the era of the cloud transition right now. And we have a few different versions of infrastructure in the wild. And I'm going to say V1 infrastructure is pretty much people have picked up what they had in an existing data center and moved it to the cloud. It's very end tier style architecture. There's VMs, there's database servers. And you're not really using anything connected, anything different. You know, it's just a bunch of compute, and those compute are talking to each other in a different way. Then you have the people that are in the V2 infrastructure that have moved on, and they're starting to be less monolithic. They're maybe starting to take advantage of containers. They have a little bit of public cloud, a little bit of private cloud, maybe even a hybrid. They're taking advantage of everything that's dynamic in the world right now. They're starting to integrate tooling into their clouds. They're starting to integrate all these different pieces in. And then you have, I'm going to call them the trailblazers, the V3 infrastructure people. So they are fully dynamic. They are very connected. They're running containers. They're running serverless. They're probably running uh, orchestrators. They're using machine learning. They're using different tools in order to feed different pieces back. And this is the state of the way that everyone tells you the world has to go today. That we're heading towards this microservice based architecture and this is how people build things. Now, there are lots of tools in this space as of today. Okay, and the tools are very good. And the tools do a lot of different things. But because unfortunately they don't take advantage of actually programming constructs, they have not been able to offer a more of a realistic approach into actually what's happening in the world. Now, Pulumi is a tool that very much targets V3. Okay, we have created a number of APIs which make life much easier for people deploying these types of systems in production or in whatever environment they want than, um, than some of the other tooling that's available. Now, we like to say it's... Where have you gone? There we go. We like to say Pulumi is modern infrastructure as code. Okay? Because it's built on languages, we like to say that you can actually... You define it in, in your declarative way that you would actually tell it the desired state, but then it's written using imperative languages. You can review it, you can test it, you can version it like everything else, but you can build it up into your CD pipelines because you can start to run tests in, uh, in different ways. Now, as it uses common languages, and I'm going to call them common languages, and the languages we support today are Go, Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, all of the .NET core stuff, so that includes C Sharp, F Sharp, and if you hate your life, VB. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry any VB developers, but why would you write in VB? Um, I'm joking. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, and what we like to say is that different teams can actually take advantage of using the languages that they know within their team and then provide different APIs that other teams outside it can use. So software developers for years have been using APIs. Okay? They've been building and writing code against packages that they've downloaded from the internet or packages that have been shared from other places on the internet. So they're used to using this black box style approach where they know what the API and the shape of the API looks like. So we're starting to enable the same thing to happen within the operations world. Okay? Boring. Boring. Okay, so I told you it's not a sales talk. I don't really mind if you don't buy it or you don't like it. It's, it's, it's new. It's, it's, it's a new way of thinking. So Pulumi has uh, built on top of the, the providers that are currently available for all the major clouds, but then we actually add different libraries on top so that you can actually do things in a simpler manner. And then across the top of all the patterns and practices libraries, we have developed these systems called Crosswalk. Now, Crosswalk, I will show some demos of this, are actually very simple APIs that will allow you to build 
well-known defaulted architectures. So for those who are in Amazon, you know that a VPC is made up of a VPC, an internet gateway, a route table, route, route table associations, and all of these different pieces. Now, of course, if you have to have people, multiple people within your organization bringing pieces in and up, or up and down all the time, they're going to forget pieces of it, and sometimes pieces of what is happening will fall through the cracks. Now, if you go to the AWS console and you create a VPC, it's a very simple wizard that will stop that from happening. So what we're trying to do is create that same style of being able to build on top of the well-known libraries that are available in order to do that. So we have one for AWS. But more importantly, and here's my sales pitch, you can come to my talk this afternoon and see this, I am actually gonna show how we do this with Kubernetes, because the Kubernetes ecosystem is massive. Who uses Kubernetes? Who really needs to use Kubernetes? <laughs> kidding, 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 just trolling, just trolling. So it's there, right, it's there, okay, it's there. Now Pulumi integrates with a load of different things and it allows you in different languages and CI, CD tools and environments and all these different things. Now, let's just go to actually see what it does. That's the salesy pitch done. So you can declare your state, as I told you, in exactly the same thing as Terraform, okay? But of course, it looks different because it's in real code. You can include conditionals and loops in real code. You can have your multi-provider workflows exactly like Terraform can. And you can start to build up and package and reuse all your different pieces just like Terraform can. Now, here is where we start to differ. We can write tests. We can have a tested approach to all of our um, code within the same language, within the same application. We don't need supplementary tools or wrapper scripts around it in order to bring these things together. And my favorite piece of the lot is that we can have advanced orchestration. We use code. Because we use code, if you have an API or you have an SDK, you can talk to those APIs or those SDKs. This is a very simple example right here. What it does is a three uh, replica canary deployment of your Kubernetes app. After it has been deployed, the three nodes, it actually calls the Prometheus API. And it calls Prometheus API for a check that you have written inside your code which says check app metrics. Once check app metrics has been satisfied, the rest of the 10 replicas within your um, Kubernetes deployment will actually continue out. Okay, so it's not, let's do step one, let's go and check our metrics tool, let's go back and do step two. It's, let's just run step one, and let step one run to completion. So it's very different here. And then lastly, the big thing that we differ on is secret management. In the world today, we suck at secret management. We, like, honestly, we may think we're good, we're not. We continually leak systems all over the place and we have secrets all over the place. I used to give talks where I told people, hey, um, passwords are sometimes in plain text, but you should have another thing that runs after it and then changes the initial password. The reason I used to tell people that is because I didn't have another way. Pulumi actually has a secrets engine built in. Okay, and this is, again, part of the free tool, where you can do it in two things. Firstly, you can set your configuration into Pulumi uh, using the secret engine. And the secret engine, by default, is Pulumi KMS. It's built on top of um, KMS and Amazon. Or you can support the other clouds plus HashiCorp Vault, which I think you should use because it's awesome. Okay. Or secondly, and I can show you in a demo, that there is a part of the secret engine where you can mark any property that comes back from the API as a secret, and it will actually encrypt it in the state. So we differ a little bit more because we have this idea of an organization is broken down into projects, and projects are broken down into stacks. For those who actually have used Terraform workspaces, this is a similar concept, but in Terraform, works, in Terraform you're not actually forced to use workspaces because there are some people in the wild who do not like them. Um, somebody sitting across the front row. But for us, it's just a bucket of resource IDs and some state, okay? It allows you to have different people, different environments, everything running on the same code, but their state is segmented. Now, people traditionally used to say that 
um, stacks are for like um, environments. So you have your dev environment, your test environment, your, your, your staging environment, production environment, whatever. I actually will push that a little bit further that each individual developer can have their own stack as well. So they can bring things up and take it down and not actually have to independently break people. So let's just go and look at some code. It's easier this way. Oh, great. You can see what I can see. Awesome. OK, so can you read me at the back? <laughs> awesome. And I'm not even going to type that, so it's easier. So let's just make a demo, OK? So demo one. Now, Pulumi is a CLI. It is not a remote execution engine, so you have to run it from either work machines or what I would suggest better is a central location that actually controls and has the correct access rights to do it. But today I'm going to say Pulumi new. Okay? Pulumi comes baked with templates that are built in that are cloud specific and language specific. So today we're going to choose AWS TypeScript. And it'll ask me some questions. What do we want to call it? Demo one's fine. Description's okay. Stack, I'm just going to call it dev. And lastly, because it's an Amazon, I'm actually going to say EU West 1. So you actually take it and it, it will ask you where do you want to deploy this stuff as like a, a thing. Now it's JavaScript, so it's going to take about 15 years to download every package on the internet. <laughs> but it, it, does, it does finish a little bit faster than you would expect. Okay, so it's just doing some extra crap. And um, it's JavaScript, right? And this is what happens. So what we have right now is we have a pre-scaffolded um, <coughs> project. Okay, so demo one. Okay, and it has our node modules, of course. It has a git ignore, it has package.json, it has package lock, it has a pulumi.yaml, but then it also has a pulumi.stack.yaml. So in my case, I chose dev. So each of these YAML files, if you treat them correctly, can be checked into source control as long as you adhere to the secret management, which I will show you in a little bit. And then lastly, we have an index.ts. Now, the simplicity of this is always kind of nice. Firstly, it imports the correct pieces. And then we actually declare that we create a new bucket, which is a new aws.s3.bucket. Okay, now everything inside Pulumi is actually namespace. So if I say constant x equals new aws dot, and then I get all the packages that are available inside aws. Okay, now of course we can go a little bit further with that, and we can move things around and create our own APIs, which I can show you in a little while. We differ a little bit here than anything else out there. This is a name that is not only applied to the resource within our state, but this is also named as part of the resource itself by default. So we will get a bucket, if I run Pulumi up right now, that says my bucket, okay? But we also append a random ID on the end. The reason by default that we do that is that there are a lot of operations in the cloud that will not allow you to create before destroy because you're using a, a, a direct name. Okay? A launch configuration is a very good example of that. You cannot create two launch configurations of the same name. So you have to auto name them in some way. So this is what we do by default. Now we can turn that off. We can turn that off by saying bucket and we can say uh, testing bucket. Okay, and now the bucket will be strongly named as configuration management camp testing bucket. Okay, it's that simple. And then lastly, we can export any IDs that we actually need. So let's just go and run a Pulumi up. So again, what it'll do is it'll check what it, no, it doesn't create a DAG. It doesn't create the graph that Terraform creates. Okay, what it does is an imperative program, so it works its way down the file. If there are relationships between the objects, it understands that they have to be created first, but it doesn't try and walk the tree, because there is no tree. Okay. So it'll give me an update to tell me what it's going to do, and I can have a look. Now, there is the ID of our bucket. The ID is broken down to be extremely simple. What it is, it is dev, which is the stack name, Demo 1, which is the project name, AWS S3 bucket, which is the type, and then the random ID or the, 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 the identifier that I gave the resource called my bucket. Now what this means 
is that it is no way, shape, or form tied to any classes or any modules or anything around. It can be refactored as much as you want. It doesn't matter. Okay, so once it's there, as long as it stays in the project and in the stack, and as long as the ID doesn't change, the my bucket, then anything else can happen to it. It can be renamed, it can be moved around, it can be refactored, it can be referenced in different ways. And we're going to say yes, and we'll roll it out, and it will actually crit. Now, I'll, let that, I'll come back to that in a second. So I said that we can write like, tests around this. So let's create a new folder, and let's uh, call the folder specs. Now, anyone ever heard of BDD, Behavioral Driven Development? So it's like a way that you can declaratively um, suggest what should have happened in a, in a human readable format that then can be executed as specs. Okay, so we're going to like, do that style of testing right now with something called Mocha and Chai. Okay, so we're going to create firstly index.ts and I'm going to say Mocha test spec. So this is pre-code that I've created that will basically act as a test generator. And what it does, you don't need to worry about any of the details except this. For every current file in this directory that ends with .ts and is not index.ts, we are going to run the mocha generator across it. Okay, very, this is for those who are in development circles, this is actually like bog standard how you would write your tests in JavaScript. Okay, and then we're going to create a spec. And a spec will look like, let's say, bucket.spec.ts, and I'm going to say bucket spec. Okay, now, the specs look like this, and these are extremely readable. What you can do is you can say, let's come back to the Pulumi dry run in a second because that's something slightly different. You can say, describing my S3 bucket, it should have an exact name. It should be in US East 1, it should have a private ACL. Now, as soon as I start including in my code, if I go in, uh, to the bottom of my code and I say run tests, then my ID has included straight away my specs. And as part of my code output, I can actually start to run this and do this. So I gave a talk on testing at FOSDEM. So I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of, of, of testing, but you can go and check that talk out. So, and then lastly, we can uh, Pulumi destroy. Okay, so see, we have the output here, and we can Pulumi destroy. And if I don't want to wait and see what it's going to do, I can say yes, which will force the prompt. But if I don't want it to do a plan first, I can say skip preview, and then I can actually remove the stack. Okay, so it, if I don't remove the stack, Plumi will say, hey, you have no resources there. Maybe you just want to remove the stack because it's just pointless having that stack sitting around. <coughs> no, not an interesting demo. It's pretty basic. It's nothing there of substance. So let's create a new one. Okay, let's uh, make their demo two. CD demo 2, Pulumi new, and I'm not going to ask the wizard this time, I'm actually going to suggest that it should be a TypeScript, and it will again ask me the same questions. Of course, this is an interactive CLI because it's 2020, right? So, you know, there's nothing should be the CI and CD proof, but you can turn off the interactive CLI. So we're going to say dev again, and we're just going to say US East 1 because I want to show you some actually like real code around building resources. Come on. So, we're going to set some stuff up in demo 2, which should be here. I am going to compute, if it ever finishes indexing, there we go, compute dash 1, come on, there we go. So I've created some resources here, okay, and the resources I have created are um, Firstly, we need to go off to Amazon and get an AMI ID, so we have exactly the same style of data sources as the other tool. Um, we have a key pair. Please don't ever like hard code your SSH key like this. Please don't. It's not the point. That's why I even said not a real key. It is a real key, but I had to remove it when I gave a demo. Um, uh, we have a security group, and we have an instance. Now. We have a little bit more syntactical sugar than anything else. Like really a little bit more syntactical sugar. I hate magic strings. I absolutely and utterly hate magic strings so much. So we wrote this library or this module in TypeScript which basically allows you to take every one of the AWS 
um, instant sizes and actually like just makes it easy to read. And we have the same for RDS and so on and so forth. But I don't know if you saw that we're actually using the power of the language right now because we know that the instance that I have written here, RDS instance type T2 small, is not assignable to an EC2 instance type. So we're not doing anything special. We're using the power of the language runtime in order for us to be told that we have errors straight away. And of course, let's just change that back. And if I removed a property, oh, undo that, I apologize. But if I removed a property, again, we would actually see that we're having a real problem because we're not adhering to the object, the, the struct that we're, so the strongly typed object that we're doing. Now, I joke about the fact that Python wouldn't be an interesting language to do this. You can do exactly the same in Python, but some of the syntax with sugar, because it's a little bit more dynamic, isn't available as it should be. So we are adding enum support for Python for all of these like syntactical sugar values to make life a little easier. So let's just pretend that I have to um, add, somebody has to wake up, I hear an alarm. <laughs> um, let's just pretend that we have to like add a loop, okay, a loop of web servers. Any JavaScript developers in here? Okay, JavaScript, you can do some mental shit, I apologize, but you can, right? So I can say let web servers equals an empty untyped array. Literally, it's like a bucket. You just throw crap into the bucket and then you see what happens. It's perfect for a demo, absolutely perfect. And I can say for let x equals zero, x is less than 100, x plus plus, and oh my god, I'm in a loop. Okay, a real programming loop. Stuff that we learned many years ago, if it was me. But yeah. And of course, because we're in a loop, we can do things within the loop. So I can say web servers dot push, and I can push every object that is created inside that loop or inside that array. So right now we have a web servers, a promise for a web servers collection that is 100 items in size. And then we know that web server doesn't exist anymore. But because I'm in a real language, I can say web servers dot map, which is like, a, like iterating in the map. And I can have a small lambda which says x to x dot. And I can pull the public DNS of all 100 servers out. Again, don't create instances that are publicly available on the internet. Please, that's one of the things is again, this is just demo code. Now we can take this a little further. Right now, oh, I apologize, there's one thing I need to do here. We need to call it web server dash dollar x because every web server resource needs to have a unique name. Now let's take it a wee bit further. Let's pretend that we have Operations people who hate developers, we're going back 40 years now, and they, those pesky developers are not allowed to create real co um, code without being strictly adhered to within the operations team, because that doesn't happen anymore, right? So we're going to create a file called webserver.ts, and inside webserver.ts, I am going to say webserver1, and I have pre-created it, and I'm moving the key pair, and I'm moving the security group, Again, don't create open bounded security groups. Um, but the most important thing here is I've created a class. Okay, so I have a, call, a class called web server, and the web server returns a read only VM, which is of type AWS EC2 instance, and it has a constructor. So it has name, AMI ID, instance type. And because we're in a type language, because it actually allows inheritance, you can create like a base class and then you can actually inherit from your base classes and therefore you don't have to create these classes that have hundreds and hundreds of inputs. Okay, so this is right now, this is only going to take three inputs and because it takes three inputs, it's pretty actually simple to um, change to. So in my code, instead of a new AWS instance, I can say a new web server, which We'll take web server dash x. That's the name. Okay? And because the name hasn't changed, I am still refactoring in the same code and no instances are, will be harmed in the, in the creation of this code. Okay? And after name, I can say AMIID, oh, uh, which will actually be Ubuntu.id. And then lastly, I can say aws.ec2.instancetypes. M5 large, for example, and let's just add that. Now, of course, this is not well formatted, but you can imagine how it looks. Just 
move some stuff around, and lint it to your heart's content. Now my code already knows that my Lambda is broken at the bottom because web servers is no longer a collection of EC2 instance types. It is actually a collection of VMs, which under the hood are EC2 instance types. So I can say X dot VM dot public DNS. Now I've refactored that into much simpler, much cleaner lines of code that can actually be controlled and packaged. Now, as operations people or infrastructure people, that web server class can be packaged as a pip uh, package or an npm package or a NuGet package and pushed around your organization so people have an, an, um, an API to adhere to. Right, demo three. We've got like seven demos. You're going to be bored of this right now. Make their demo three. Who likes I am management? <laughs> Who loves Jason for I am management? Who really needs a hobby? <laughs> awesome. Okay, Jason is another one of these things that I hate. Like, I absolutely, it's a language that has, I'm going to call it a language. It has sort of existed and people have been forced to use it for a number of different things, but it's a pain in the ass. It is literally a pain in the ass. Now, we have APIs. So we can take that pain away from you. You don't need it, it doesn't matter, right? So let's go back to demo three. Please open. And we can go to index.ts. Let's get rid of this crap. And I can say, I am role. Scaffold for me, please. I am role, okay? Now, that's the basis of what an I am role would be. Can anybody tell me the JSON structure for an assume role policy for AWS? <laughs> no, because usually we would all go and have to look it up, right? It's just the way it works. So what we can do is we can say assume role policy, okay, which is the, ob the, the parameter that we're creating. And we have aws.iam dot assume role policy for a principle. And the principle will actually be a service, which will be ec2.amazon.aws.com no JSON involved. And that will actually scaffold the correct um, assume role policy. Now, let's pretend that we're in Kubernetes world and we need to attach extra policies to our role so that we can actually use that in Kubernetes. So if I say I am role extra policies, and you usually have like a list of policies like this, okay? And then if you really need some more, you can say aws.iam.managepolicies. And you can choose any one that you want because they're all there. But we can loop. Okay, this is the beauty of it. So I can say for policy in manage policies. Yep. Oh, I apologize. For const policy and manage policies. I can say let count equals zero. And I'm glad I spelled that correctly. You will be surprised how my spelling is sometimes. <laughs> Equals new AWS dot I am dot um, policy attachment, role policy attachment, I apologize. And it will be my role dash um, dollar count plus plus. And in here, I have to say policy ARN is the policy, and I say role is the role. Now, even if you hate the tool, even if you hate the language, what I'm trying to show, you have to see that that is a simpler approach to IAM am management than anything else. And we have this idea where we have, um, we have strongly typed documents, okay? So if I actually say const um, I am uh, policy, which is of type document equals that, okay? Now in here, we know a policy document adheres to a standard specification. It's nothing new, we know that it's there. Okay, so the first thing is I can say is a version and I can choose either of the two versions, but if I change something, we'll immediately see that the version is not the correct version. Okay, so let's undo that. And then lastly, it's actually, uh, policy is actually a list of statements. So it is a strongly typed 
object of uh, a collection of statements and a statement can have a number of different pieces so it can have a SID, it can have an effect, it can have, oh that's why it's not working, yeah, it can have a principle, it can have an action or a not action and it can have a resource. Now I can take that exact um, document and it will even tell me what's missing from it and so on and so forth. You can't have empty things on effect. So we can say allow. Principle can be star. And immediately the IDE has told us before we've even gone to our CLI that something is actually useful and available. Okay, number four, secret management. Make their demo four. How am I doing for time? Loads of time. You have at least three more hours of this talk. <laughs> you do. <laughs> new. So this time I don't need um, AWS. I just need a new TypeScript project, which will just actually um, um, actually just scaffold some things together. And we're just going to create a, a small thing. Now Terraform has created this package called the Random Package. Random Package is one of my favorite packages for demos. It really is because it allows you to do things like random passwords and random pets and so on and so forth. Now I just finish here and I'm going to npm install at pulumi slash random because everything has its own package and it's deployed as its own package thing. Now if I go in to my code, demo 4, there's only 8 more demos. Um, if I say import star as random from at pulumi slash random and then what I can say is I can say const my secret value, secure value, equals new uh, random dot random password. And we're just going to say my password. And I'm going to try and adhere to good password policy. And it's going to be length of 30. And it's going to have special characters true. Uh, and we have a password here, okay? Now if I took that and I output it, it would be in plain text on my browser. And I'll show you, okay? So if I copy the same code and I say my secure value 2 and I make it password 2, Pulumi has, I told you Pulumi has this idea of a secrets engine built in. So I can go into the custom resource options of any resource and I can say additional secret outputs and I know that the result of the random password comes out in a parameter called result. And I can say that. Now if I say const export, oh, excuse me, export const uh, password1 equals my secure value dot result. And I can say the same. And I can say 2. Then if I go and actually run Pulumi up, and if I and I say yes and skip preview because we don't care about this, then what we'll actually see is we'll see that the first value comes out in plain text, the second value actually comes out as a secret value. Okay, now the most important thing here is what it looks like in the state. We have state, okay. <coughs> As per the last talk, unfortunately, we have state. That's just the, the way of the word, right? But I can look at the state at any point because I can pull me stack export. The state is a lot simpler, a lot simpler, okay? But the interesting thing is we can see one as a random, as a, a secure, uh, an unsecured value, but we can see the second result is actually stored using a ciphertext. So, and only the people who have access to this stack and this project will be able to allow their Pulumi app to decrypt it. Now, I can also do it in a different way. Pulumi config set, and we're going to say it's root password, and we're going to say it's my password, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, because I'm trying to be secure. And if I go and actually have a look at that in my source code, if you do something like that in Pulumi, then that will be in plain text in your Pulumi file. I told you that these files, if you adhere to them correctly, can be checked in. Okay, so instead of running that command, we can run exactly the same and mark it as a secret. And because we can mark it as a secret, 
it will actually generate it using the secure string again in the format that is actually designed inside the state file. This is now 100% safe that you can check into your source control. Doesn't matter. No, it's, it's a ciphertext that's ba uh, based built on uh, the project, the stack, and all these different things. I can't even copy that to another project because Pulumi will be like, that was not designed by this project. So it's broken down into something much smaller. So secret management is something that's actually extremely important. And I can show you why it's so important here. Because, um, I, so I have AWS account cleanup. So I have a Lambda I wrote that cleans up my AWS account. And I have like a load of different things in here. But the most important thing is that I have a CI account. And I have a dev account. And both of them are all actually in like, uh, I can store those uh, credentials actually in my system because they're actually secured and, and, and used in a different way. So, demo five. We're getting there, we're getting closer. So I promised you that uh, Crosswalk. Crosswalk is our opinionated APIs across the top of different pieces. Now, this may worry some people because it actually makes life a little too simple. But again, I'm going to scaffold an AWS um, uh, TypeScript example. It's OK. He's a Python developer, I can tell. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm kidding. 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 OK, so Crosswalk is Crosswalk for VPC, Crosswalk for a uh, API Gateway, Crosswalk for Lambda, Crosswalk for all these different things are making life much easier for lots of different people within the Plume ecosystem right now. A lot, OK? Just give me demo five. Come on. Come on. There we go. Now, creation of a VPC, I told you, has many different resources. Many, many, many different resources. And of course, if you want to add in like a number of subnets, then you need to do lots of extra different things that goes with it. Now, if I say AWS X dash VPC public CIDR block, that is the code that will scaffold an AWS VPC with a default public subnet, with a default internet gateway, with a route, with a route table, and a single route table association. Anybody, anybody care to argue that that's not cool. <laughs> For me, it's so, so simple, right? In fact, you don't even have to pass in a CIDR block. You can just pass in a name, and we will choose one of the supernets that are available for um, your, your private VPCs. OK, now we can take this further. And where we can take it further is we can start to do AWS X. So let's pretend that we actually need to create a more interesting VPC that the first thing we want to do is get all of the availability zones in the region when we have to deploy the VPC into. Then we're going to create a CIDR block, a top level CIDR block. We're going to create a number of availability zones based on the length of the VPC. We're going to do the same for the NAT gateways. But I'm actually going to use something super simple here in order to develop my uh, subnets. So what that will do is that will create a private and a public subnet for every one of the availability zones. And every one of the CIDR blocks for the subnets will be a slash 24 size. Okay? Taking away that hassle, taking away all the different pieces, and it will do all the route table associations that go with it. We even went a little further. We were able to show in a proof of concept to a potential customer that VPCs that need to be peered are the bane of everyone's life in Amazon, especially when you're trying to script it. So we created this idea where we had a VPC class. Okay? Now, inside Pulumi, you can create your own API. And as long as you um, extend what's called the component resource, then you can actually group as many pieces of information you want inside that API. Now, that API, it sets the VPC. It sets the internet gateway. It decides whether you need to turn on or turn off Route 53. It does all the VH, uh, VPC DHCP options. It does the CIDR calculations. It does the subnets based on the CIDR calculations. It does the route tables. It does the routes. It does the route table associations and blah, 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 blah. Now, of course, to give that to a developer and say, hey, create me two VPCs that you can test against and then peer them together. Uh, 
Most of them, because they don't do it on a regular basis, would have to Google their way through it or Stack Overflow their way through it. Whereas you as operations or cloud infrastructure people can give them a very simple, nice API across the top that allows them to do it. And because it's a strongly typed object, so we have a, an app VPC and we have a data VPC, we can say app VPC dot configure peering against the data VPC. And inside the configure peering method, so it's like an extension method, it will actually do the VPC peering connection, it will work out if it has to auto accept, it'll do the routes, the route table associations, and blah, 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 blah. So for developers, this is super simple. They don't have to worry about the pieces that they're not strong at doing. You're taking away that pain that allows them to be much more productive, much faster. This is what our goal is as infrastructure people, ops people, right? We need to adhere to making life a little better. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm actually not, but I am, so it's fine. And then we can, and I'll just give a sneak preview into uh, one of my talks this afternoon. Um, you can actually give developers the simplicity that will create a multi-cloud Kubernetes cluster in Amazon and Azure in 14 lines of code. And the, four, the only reason it's 14 lines of code is because we're exporting the cube config, but developers that can then take that cube config and start to deploy their applications based on top of it. Okay? These are all public examples. So there's github.com slash pulumi slash examples and everything is there. Now, Docker. Anyone use Docker? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give my opinions on it, but it's, that's, that's for a conversation over a beer, I can promise. Um, Docker is one of those things where you have sort of two external workflows, okay? You have to do the Docker builds and then you ingest the Docker build as part of your, of your work. I don't believe you need to do that. So of course we have created an API that actually will do a Docker build. So this is in Azure, okay? I, I can never leave out the Microsoft people because I always get told off for favoriting a specific cloud. So this is, this is going to deploy an application, a Docker container in Azure, okay? You need a resource group. There's, a people, in the There's people in the room going, Azure, really? Um, so the, the, the more interesting thing is, is that what you do is, um, here is an application folder called Node App, which is here. Okay, which has my Docker file and it has a really sophisticated app, like super sophisticated. But the more interesting thing is, is that as part of my Pulumi application, we say a new Docker image pointing to the Node app folder and it will actually interact with Docker under the hood and include the Docker build as part of your Pulumi application. So as your CI pipeline, you don't need two different processes. It's one process that does the same thing. And then lastly, there's like some serverless stuff I can show, okay? Serverless stuff is always a very interesting demo because people are like, what? Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting because we can do a lot of very cool things with it, okay? So first thing is we have like a publish folder. We just point to a folder on disk and it'll take care of it. Then we have a DynamoDB table. We have the IAM rule, the IAM rule policy. And we have a Lambda function. We only have to put the Lambda function at the folder location and Pulumi will zip it up and it will actually take care of deploying it for you. But we can start to do interesting stuff. So we can include real code, real application logic code in our Pulumi apps. So here is a Swagger spec. Here's a Swagger route handler. And then in my actual API deployment, I can push in these different pieces. A better example, which we'll show you, will be um, a, uh, where's my Twitter? Slackbot. Okay, so we wrote a Slackbot, an, an example for a Slackbot. Okay, so we have a DynamoDB table, an SNS topic, we have some classes, so some strong objects that we pass around. And we actually will scaffold an API gateway, and each of the routes in the API gateway has the application code embedded in it, which Pulumi will understand that that is actually a Lambda. It will create the associated Lambda, create the associated Lambda um, link between the API gateway and the Lambda, and it will actually really deploy in it and actually take that code and really push it up. So we're actually bringing together these teams who have the motto of you build it, you run it. So if they build it and they run it, why do they need these two different ecosystems? Why do they need an infrastructure ecosystem and a dev ecosystem? They're completely separate. They're completely um, not separate things. So I'll go back to some slides because I've 
bored everyone with demos. Um, policy as code is a big thing for us. Anyone heard of HashCorp Sentinel? Yeah, a few people allows you to write specs, they um, check your, your code and check everything is working. We have embedded that same style process where you can actually create policies in Pulumi. Again, it's part of the talk I gave in FOSDEM, but you have a Pulumi preview, a Pulumi validate, and a Pulumi update, and it will not actually deploy the code unless you fall um, unless you actually adhere to the security policies. It'll actually be pa probably part of my, my system tonight or my talk this evening, but you can write policies that look like this where, for example, everything must have a cost tag because it's the bane of my life when people actually don't put cost allocation tags and resources. And then you can stop your company doing crappy stuff on the internet like having open security groups. And then we can actually start to say that the logs on an S3 bucket must be enabled and that they must be like kicked out in less than 45 days. And we can even say adherence to GDPR, if our application needs to adhere to GDPR, we can write a spec that says do not allow this to be deployed in US East, okay, or anywhere in the US, and we can actually write that code that does that as well. And there's loads more. You can even do things like if you have sysadmins and, and uh, DBAs that don't allow you to run the latest databases, you can write a spec that says it must be less than a specific version of a database because it hasn't been tested and gone through compliance training. So there's like a whole different way, but we really believe that we're starting to be this connected way of being able to easily create like infrastructure in the cloud and we're big fans of the movement that we're trying to do with regards to Crosswalk. So thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any questions or wants some stickers, I have a lot with me and I don't want to take them home, so please come and take them from me. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, sir. Um, there's a break now, and also a break for basically 20 minutes.